Hello and welcome to the May 2022 York virtual live online meeting on face, not on Facebook, but on YouTube and originating from wherever we are around Salt Lake and somewhere else around Salt Lake is Morris. How are you doing, Morris? Uh, very good, uh, Clint. Thank you very much. I want to welcome everybody to our meeting this evening. I um, want to mention two or three things coming up. Uh, field day, which Clint will be talking about more in a few minutes. Um, we are having a steak fry again this year. It'll be on the 16th of July at the Spruces, as usual. Uh, and then, 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 oh, yes, classes. <laughs> classes, um, technician in general classes will be starting up uh, about the middle of September. Uh, specifically, the technician class will start on Monday, the 12th of September, and the general class will start on Wednesday, the 14th of September. And to remind everybody of the, ten, the new 10-meter net, which is at 8 o'clock, I believe, on Wednesdays, and I do not have the frequency in front of me. If anybody does, please speak up. And the 6-meter net, which is on uh, Friday nights at 9 p.m. at uh, 50.150, and uh, Noji also runs a Wednesday night, I'm sorry, a Friday night six-meter net uh, at 50.140 at 8 p.m. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to bring up right now, and uh, will come back to me later for something else, but uh, go back to you, Clint. All right, thank you, Morris. I'm waiting for a poll on the YouTube chat to chime in when the meeting and um, the net actually is, unless somebody else happens to know it off the top of their head. Yeah, I, I do know. Oh, um, go ahead. The, uh, it's um, at uh, 28.345 megahertz. Uh, and uh, the time again? Eight oh, at uh, eight eight o'clock, uh, upper side band uh, twenty eight three four five at uh, eight p.m. Uh, that's on Wednesdays, right? Wednesday, yep. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay, that'll do it. And also, in case you're not netted out, there's a net that's been going for at least forty years that I know of on one forty four dot two fifty on two meters at nine p.m. on Monday night. That's that's a sideband on 144.200. So that is an ongoing thing, and people check in from all over the place. I've heard people check in from Boise and uh, down in central Utah, although not everybody can hear all the stations to check in from such uh, distances. And let's see here. Morris did mention field day. That is the last full week let's see the fourth full weekend of always the fourth full weekend of june it's not the last weekend of june although it often works out that way but this year it'll be the 25th and 26th or the big days that field day will be occurring york will do its field day up at pace and lakes again where we have done since at least the 90s for, for the most part we encourage you to go up there, bring your trailer. Remember, it's at altitude, so it'll be cool at night, but that'll be a wonderful respite from the usually very hot weather we have down in the valley. And and as, as he mentioned, we are also going to have the steak fry up at the spruces on the 16th of July. We haven't quite decided yet on what the ticket price will be. Expect something in the 10 to $15 range, I, now I need, I don't know what sound an asterisk makes, but that's subject to change because as you've also noticed, prices are subject to change for all the materials and food and everything. So we have no idea what we need to charge for this so that we don't break the bank, but we do have the site reserved and that's up at the spruces in Big Cottonwood Canyon, also where it's been for a couple of years. 
Let's see here. Um, Gary, you have, I'll wake you up now, give you a chance yeah. to unmute. And you tell us about what's about the Lemington station, the perks it has for UARC members of appropriate license class, general or higher, and what's going on okay. down there. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I'm Gary kk 7 dv Hi, everyone. I wanted to take a minute because this month um, on May 28th, that's Saturday, May 28th, we have a site visit coming up for the uh, Lemington HF remote, if you've heard of that. Let me just share my screen a little for a little bit. So, okay, there we go. Can you see it? Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, so at Lemington, just um, it's, I think, five or 10 years ago, uh, Morris arranged for the availability of the site and uh, so five years ago I think in 2018 we put up a remotely controlled transceiver that everybody in Newark with a general class license so you have HF privileges could use this this uh, wonderful site which is in Juab County I'm up north here in Cache Valley 100 miles north of Salt Lake and this site's 100 miles south so it's Newark is really statewide and we even have some new members um, in other states because they like this uh, this HF remote so let's see if we, um, in case you didn't already know, if you go to the UARC website, over here on the left, there's HF remotes, and that tells you how to get started with the UARC HF remotes. So just by being a member of UARC for $20 a year, you can access two different uh, remotes, one in this one that we're going to visit this month in Lemington, and also one in Fairview, the, uh, the cabin of Glenn WA7X. They're both wonderful. And we get lots of compliments. There's some really hardcore CW users love it. And over the years, like last year, we put up a big beam antenna for eight, eight element log periodic beam for 20 through 10. That's really useful on those bands. But even on 40, like for check into the beehive net, you can use a, a G5 RV that's been up for, I think, 10 years. So anyway, this is how you can actually get started and use it. Some clubs on remotehams.com charge $200 a year to access a remote transceiver. Ours is just comes with you UARC membership. So 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 any this has been a great project. Uh, this is from 2019 when we put up that the uh, second wire antenna, the NPED half wave that's resonant on 160 and it's 100 and, it's 260 feet long from this pole. We have things to do like like check on this pole one a fire came through and burned some nylon so we're going to make sure it's wire and other things to do laird's been dragging the road to keep the weeds down chuck and i are going to calibrate the rotator and um, there's a weather station there so we can monitor wind which around christmas time reached 90 miles per hour so fortunately that the new uh, weather station and camera and antenna did survive that that last winter and there's some computer upgrades and road keep the weeds down and check the roof it was leaking earlier we put some sealant on there and check the ups battery system which has held us up through a, a few power outages that's been good so so a bunch of stuff to do on saturday may 28th i think we have a handful of people here uh, ready to go and anybody else that really wants to get involved in development and not just using is welcome to join in so let's see i think that's about it there's i guess i'll also mention that in the UARC um, YouTube page, there are a bunch of meeting recordings. One of them was was made by uh, Max NG7M. I think it's just HF made easy here. It, it talks about sort of advanced use of this Lemington HF remote for really contesting CW, which is a possibility, but a lot of people just use it to check into the Beehive net daily. And it's, it's easy for that for sharing. So anyway, that's what's going on at Lemington coming up uh, later this month. Uh, go ahead. Hey. Yeah, here. go ahead. Uh, yeah, let's. We probably ought to mention that uh, we 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 cannot have just anybody coming up to the site and working because we have a, a limited uh, ability to support people there. And uh, yeah, it's really just a handful. Um, but it is. Yeah, everyone can so, understand how it works and not just be a user. So right. If but if anybody is interested in doing that, uh, please coordinate through you and the rest of the board so that we can uh, coordinate who, yeah. who ends up there. Makes and, sense. And I'm KK7DV at ARRL.net. So KK7 Delta Victor. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I did have one other thing I thought I ought to mention, or okay. Chuck mentioned that I thought we ought to discuss. Uh, with the passing of Gordon K7HFV, we have a major hole in our uh, development network or whatever you might want to call it 
uh, we're looking now for a microvolt editor. So if you have experience in creating uh, newsletters uh, as opposed to uh, advertising or anything else like that, uh, you can contact me or any other member of the board and uh, we can discuss the possibilities of, of having you work with us on, in doing that. What we'll probably have you do is put something together and we'll uh, evaluate it and see whether we want to go with that or not. Okay. Go ahead, Clint. All right. Uh, just a few things to follow up on. Let's see. Uh, uh, K5UDO asked when the two meter sideband net was. That is Monday at 9 p.m. local time. And I thought I'd mention that it's just, you know, to murder more time. Uh, I mentioned this. Oops, that's that's not going to work. Uh, let me minimize a few of these. So what you see on the screen here is uh, if you go to uh, sdrutah.org, the Northern Utah Web SDR. One of the things we have is a Web SDR here in the valley, and it's I need to update the banner, but it has two meters on it, so you can actually click two meter low. And click right here and when the net's happening you can listen to the two meter net from your computer but we recently in the past two weeks added six meters so you can also listen to that here if it's there below 51 meg on whatever and i know glenn tested out the friday six meter net and uh, could hear he could everybody hear everybody on this that he could hear everybody on his station so you don't need to be in the Salt Lake Valley to surreptitiously enjoy the net uh, or the net, some of these nets. I thought I'd mention that. Of course, it has UHF as well and all, all two meters. thought I'd mention that. All right. Now, uh, although uh, Morris touched on it recently, uh, as everybody probably knows, or if not, this will become be a shock. We lost uh, Gordon Smith on the 21st of uh, last month after a several year uh, fight with cancer. Um, the memorial for him will be this Sunday, the 15th at 2 p.m. at the Mount Tabor Lutheran Church. There's rather limited uh, seating there because we're expecting members of his congregation and all that to fill up stuff. Plus this other congregation of hams probably will show up. But the meeting will at the very least be streamed live on the public Facebook and possibly on YouTube for Mount Tabor, T-A-B-O-R, Lutheran Church. Uh, if you go to the UARC page, utahrc.org, in fact, I will do that right now, uh, short bio right here, click here. I will update that uh, with uh, more specific information as it becomes available on exactly the name of the uh facebook page or something like that i have the I, what i have the web link it's um facebook.com slash uh mt for mount tabor t-a-b-o-r s-l-c slash so facebook.com slash mount tabor s-l-c dot or I'm sorry, SLC slash. Okay. But uh, we will, uh, of course, we will uh, miss Gordon. And as everyone knows, he was a, he was a uh, well-known Elmer to many of us on the air and uh, in, a nice, in a friendly voice to the newcomer. So uh, he will be missed. So anyway, didn't bring need to bring the room down, but I consider it a celebration of of Gordon as much as anything, to, you know, to, to, for these uh, meetings. All right, anything else we should cover, Morris, before we start throwing it? Just our guest? We, we really ought to mention that Gordon has been a member of the club uh, since 1962, so that's uh, 60 years. Uh, quite a while. Uh, and, so, and so, as you can imagine, anybody that's been involved, deeply involved with the club in that period of time, 
has uh, left the hole. Uh, in this case, it's a giant canyon uh, uh, that uh, he's left, and we have been scrambling to try and fill in the little pieces here and there that we can, and uh, outreaching, uh, trying to find somebody to help fill one of the major roles, which is the microvolt editor. So, anyway, uh, Gordon was an incredible guy. Uh, you mentioned being an Elmer. Sometimes you found out that he was being an Elmer to you when you didn't even realize it. So, uh, it's just hard to say enough nice things about him. So I will stop. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, all right. Noji, I'll wake you up and get things, <laughs> you to get unmuted. Now, now that we've... <laughs> well, I mean... Yeah. Have we set you up yet, Noji? <laughs> Absolutely. No, no problem. Okay. Now, um, uh, a lot of, if you've been, in, if you, if you've been around Utah, you will certainly know Noji. That, that actually, that could be a little button, you know, no, no, G, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, just, but anyway, uh, so you're going to do two things for us tonight. I believe you're going to do the short topic, then the long topic. Do I have that right? Or is that, or do you, I, I can't tell if that's a look at surprise or shock um, or horror or what? Yeah, you know, I, so I got talked into this. I'm not sure how, but yeah, I'll be doing a, a presentation here and then a, and then a, a discussion, I guess, afterwards. I'm not sure how that works, but I'm going to play that second one by ear. Okay. All right. Well, um, I would say you need no introduction, but we like to introduce people anyway. So introduce yourself. All right. Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm of KN0JI. I live in Orem. I've got a um, wife and four wonderful kids, and, and um, I just love ham radio and and I've just been enjoying so many things in ham radio. Um, that's one of my problems. In fact, I've, my interests spread across the spectrum quite, a, quite far. So I really like it a lot. I enjoy contesting. I enjoy DXing. I, I, my, my number one most favorite thing of all <laughs> is installing antennas on people's roofs. And so every, every month, it seems, I've, I'm always up on people's roofs doing that. But I, I enjoy sitting with people, talking with them, um, even if it's not ham radio. But anyway, just stuff like that. But in the end, I'm just I'm just a kid with the radio. OK, so, OK, no, Jay, here at the start of the meeting. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank uh, you, Clint. Yeah. So uh, for your almost corner, talk a little bit about repeaters. What do you have? What do you have for us? Well, OK, the, so let me bring up my. Um, my, I've got a, um, not a PowerPoint, but a PDF that I use. Let me just bring that up. Then I can show it and see what I'm talking about here. Of course, now I got to find it. Here it is. Okay. Let's see. And when what I, what um, Mike kind of asked me about is, is this portable repeater setup thing? Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to talk about. And uh, let's see. In, in the meantime, yeah. Uh, while you're finding that, one thing that we should tell everybody to not do: never do this. Never try to connect one repeater with another repeater with your crossband radio. <laughs> never, never do that. Yes, it's never, thank you. It never, never works. Thank you for um, mentioning it. That's a good, good um, suggestion to it, not do. Yeah, it'll, if you forget, <laughs> if, if you aren't watching, it'll ruin your radio. It's, I've seen radios be ruined. Fortunately, they were ruined for <laughs> everybody monitoring the repeater. So are you able to find it, Noji? Yes, I got it. And um, now I'm trying to figure out how to bring up both Zoom and this at the same time. I think that's not a problem let me let me do this so i'm going back to zoom okay let me let me try this and see how this works i don't know how well it's going to look so i'm going to share 
Okay. And uh, you are the, shared. Okay. So this is just a, um, all, I've, all, I've, all this is is just a, um, an article that I wrote about um, a portable repeater kit. Let me just explain what that means. So, so what it is is uh, once upon a time, um, my family was asked to help out with the, uh, communication on the stake trek. And so this is a reenactment of the Mormon pioneer trek up in Wyoming. And we quickly um, found out that, um, that, that there was no communication between the beginning and the end of the trek, which was 15 miles apart, which was not normally a problem, except there was a hill between them. And I thought, well, you know, I can solve this problem. And so here I did. I, I went ahead and created this thing. This isn't what I wanted to show you. Okay. No, I, I guess this is. So, um, well, this is the kit. All right, hang on just one second, because I think that I've got the wrong thing here. So I'm going to okay. quit share. I'm going to go back and. Ah, here we go. Okay. All right. So let me just give you a quick little bit of a background. All right. You know what? I'm just going to go ahead and go with that one anyway. I think that that's, that's going to serve the purpose and that way I won't waste everybody's time as much. So let's go back to sharing. There I am. So same document. So this is, this is what I made called a portable repeater kit. And what it did for us is it solved that problem that we had in which we had um, one place where we can set up this portable repeater and between those two places. And it, what it did was it allowed the beginning of the trek and the end of the trek to communicate. However, there are some rules to follow with um, setting up this thing. So what this was is simply um, a demonstration of or explanation of what this kit contained. Um, and that's what Mike was asking about. And so this little document just explains how to make one. And this is just simply like one of those um, Pelican type cases. This is actually one from Harbor Freight. And this is the um, parts list here. Here's a radio that I use, a mobile that I took and um, I jimmied up. Here's some of the cutouts that I made for that um, portable repeater kit. Um, and here's how to make it. But Here's, here's the wires I use, Anderson's, to make it very convenient for me. And here's my battery that I use for it. And all that stuff fit in. I, I made this, or I put together this um, antenna. This antenna I bought online. I put it on this angle right here. And, and I could just simply stick it in the back of the radio. So this mobile radio with this antenna um, did the trick. And I set all this on top of a, um, a little um, wooden table and put it inside of a shower tent on that hill and then, you know, um, guide it down and so forth so that it wouldn't get disturbed by the wind. And it gets pretty windy out there in Wyoming. But anyway, so this repeater kit did their trick and that's all, it's, all it contains is right here. So you have this radio, the coax, which only needed to be about, um, well, if I needed to use an external antenna, for instance, um, then I could use the coax. In this case, I didn't need the external antenna. I just used the internal one, uh, the one I attached to it. And then, you know, the battery and that's, pretty much it. And then the, the thing is though, that when I set up the repeater, then I have to, um, this, is, this is explains how to set that repeater up um, and repeater mode. This is a crossband repeat that I used. Um, the thing is that the frequencies that I use for his repeater, I actually coordinated with the frequency coordinator in Wyoming to get permission to use the two frequencies I did. And these two frequencies happen to be um, um, repeater um, output frequencies that um, he recommended that I use for this crossband repeat. The problem with this though, is that when you do set up a crossband repeat like this, then you need to be at the location of the crossband repeater for two reasons. One is so that you can uh, mitigate problems if there, you know, anything should arise and you can turn off the repeater. And two, um, so that you can ID um, because most crossband repeaters cannot ID themselves. In fact, 
I'm only aware of two mobile radios that can actually um, do um, self IDing, and that is, they are both Kenwoods. Yeah. One is the um, the D710A, and the other one is the V71. Yeah, V71. That's right. Mm-hmm. So those two are the only mobiles I'm aware of that can actually um, issue an ID. You can leave those, but even those two, you still you got to find a way, and it's pretty easy. You can you know use a remote to get into the um, re- um, to the radio and then control it if something should go wrong. But those two requirements have to be there. So that means with this radio, I had to be with the crossband repeat and stay with it the whole time that it was being used as a crossband repeater, because this particular radio could not do those, could not ID. And every 10 minutes, I just put it out of crossband um, and then ID'd on both sides, put it back in crossband and away I went. So, the, you know, as long as you follow those rules and then set it up, you're good to go. But this yeah. is essentially what I did. Um, and um, it solved the problem. Uh, my uh, um, church leaders were quite amazed that I was able to solve this problem. They wanted to know how to do it. And I sent them this little um, document and they were like, wow, um, we didn't know that ham radio can do such a thing. So they were amazed and everybody was happy and we got the help we needed. In fact, there were several injuries, as I recall, and some um, food coordination needs that had to happen. And our tents fell down and had to talk about that. So instead of taking the, the, the hour and a half trip back and forth between the beginning and the end of the trek, um, we were able to communicate instantly almost. And there we go. So that's it. That's, that's all I really wanted to say about that. I think that's kind of fulfilled what Mike wanted. Is that what you wanted to see, Mike? Yeah, that, uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, thanks, uh, Noji. I'd like to get a, a copy of that. I noticed it's uh, August of uh, 2021, so I'm going to look that up. Yeah, I well, and I will send you this um, link to this. Um, it's online. All my documents like this are online. I could send this to you, and then you can do what you want with it. Yeah, that would be fine. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Uh, uh, anybody who uh, would like to then have a copy of it, they could um, email me, and I'd uh, send them a copy as well. That, that's all right with you, Noji. Absolutely, and yes. and I'll send you the other document that. Um, that talks about um, crossband repeaters in general and how to set them up, the rules and everything. I, I'm glad you mentioned the 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 difficulty in IDing them. The other way I've done it too is on a radio that did not have it is you just have to use a dual bander going the other way and and switch to the the other frequent receive frequency of the crossband and throw an ID out there occasionally. That that'll satisfy, but you got to remember to do that. It's people well, people tend to ID okay go on the outbound way, but the signal the repeat of their monitoring does not ID your radio. So, yeah, unless you go out of your way to cause it to happen. All right, and uh, go ahead, Morris. Well, yeah, and can you accomplish the legal? Uh, intent here by every time you transmit either uh one one person using the repeater or another uh identifying themselves and the repeater well um, that's a that's a misnomer that people or the um a myth that people like to believe that that you can simply um from afar just simply id through a repeater and call that good well well i mean it is in the rules though if, if you, the repeater does not, I don't think needs automatic ID. If you can guarantee that everybody use, using it says it's like they, if, like like through the uh, W7SP repeater. In the old days, that's what people would do. And I don't think the rules exclude that, but the automatic ID is far preferred. And I think the, the, I think the rules are different for automatic ID repeaters. But I mean, it is perfectly legal to, to identify a crossband repeater from the other end. All the FCC really gives a rat about is that they know who to send the pink slip to <laughs> and who to talk to. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, it is it is perfectly fine, legal and fine if you were to. But if anybody forgets, they're in real thing. <laughs> well, I mean, within ten minutes or the end. Yeah. So I mean, so a lot of uh, a lot of. Crossband repeaters are are half legally operated, 
and and what I mean by that is is that supposing they're trying to they have it set up on a mountain so they can get into a repeater from the bottom of a valley where there's no coverage when they're going out to their cross band they're probably using their own call sign and chances are that the person who owns the radio is is the same call sign as a radio it's when the repeater comes back and is sending what's on the repeater that your call sign does not exist and that is the problem um the one of the ways around it I know the Kenwoods do it, is to put them into half crossband repeat. So they're only repeating in one direction because it's often the case that, like, this happens on, this. we do this on the Wasatch 100. We can hear the repeater fine on our handy talkie. We just can't get into it. So we set up a half crossband repeater so that we, you know, on our dual bander, and, you know, so we're listening on two meters and transmitting on 70 centimeters. Uh, on their dual band handy talkie so we're getting out with a full 50 watts with our ht on low power and since we are every time and every time we are we are iding uh, operating normally in iding it's this the id is satisfied sometimes it's not it might be the other guy at, at like at the wasatch 100 one of the other guys at the at the race uh checkpoint where we are but there is an id going out and if somebody wanted to ask us questions on what was going wrong, they would be able to do what they need to do and be able to ask someone who was there. And that's what they're really cared about. And plus it's locally the, at the point. So but I, I think that's the, the other direction where it's repeating the repeater is the part where the legal ID almost never occurs. Anyway. No, gee, I got the impression that you disagreed with that. Is that well, did I um, so I. I, I um, actually got my doctrine from uh, um, John Lloyd, and um, I'll just kind of leave it at that. So, so yeah, I, I do disagree <laughs> with that, um, yeah. and, and and others, but that's okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, know. yeah, I, I I I come from the Gordon school. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 yeah and, Gordon and, was our absolute authority. <laughs> well, right, right. I mean, the, all the FCC really cares about is to who to talk contact to shut something off that's all they really care that's all they really care about um well and then they also want some way for you to um control the machine too so that's, something that, that's go right wrong. That, that's right too that's another thing too i when i've run crossband i've used the dual band handy talkie receiving on both bands so it could not be jammed yeah. by the the radio if it got stuck i could remotely shut it off but uh, that's the other thing too and that's that is tough to do um, without, yeah. I don't think there's anything you can just buy and do that with. Okay. Um, all right. Well, uh, I guess it's time for you to launch into your topic. All right. I'll share the screen mm -hmm. and we'll see what we have, what happens from there. All right. Let me see if my clicker works now. No, it's not. And so that means that I have to undo my, I have to stop sharing, get out of my PowerPoint, and then reinitialize it. Then I can reshare it. Then we'll be okay. I think that's how it should work. All right. All right, there we go. Much better. Okay. And you can still hear me, hear me okay. Is that right, uh, Clint? That is true. We can. Uh, all right, very good. Thanks so much. Uh, well, there you, there you go. I'm going to talk a little bit about SWR. Hopefully it's... Um, you know, good enough for people. I, I don't know how much people know or don't know or how much in depth they enjoy, but at any rate, um, SWR, and there's my name, Noji, K-N-0-J-I. And um, this um, PowerPoint will be available. I think I've already sent it to Mike and Clint, but it's available. I could put it on uh, the, the um, Utah Facebook page and other places if, you know, that you want to see it there. But yeah, um, Clint and um, Mike, feel free to share it with whomever wants to see this. 
if you can stand it. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and launch into it. So SWR. So the discussion about SWR starts with a transmission line. And basically transmission line is nothing more than just a wire that carries your signal from the transceiver back to the antenna and back to, you know, back and forth like that. That's what, that's what it is. So anything could be a transmission line. So to, today though, we depend really heavily on coaxial cable for amateur radio transmission lines, although there's been so many in the past. So now just to let you know, coax has certain characteristics about it I'd like to mention. One is the characteristic impedance, which doesn't vary a whole lot with frequency uh, within most amateur bands, uh, mostly between the really low frequency and up to about a gigahertz, at least for me. Now, this is kind of a model of what a, a coax looks like um, down you know, in the guts. So this is like a per um, unit look at a coaxial cable. As you can see, it has a resistance, an inductance, a conductance, and a capacitance. And a conductance is nothing more than inverse of re, uh, resistance. And so what it is is simply the, the, um, the resistance, as you might say, between the two conductors in your coax. Um, and hopefully that's not uh, shorted out. So it's gonna be a, a very um, high um, resistance, or in other words, a very low conductance. And that's what we're looking for here. Now, the characteristic impedance of a coaxial cable arises from its um, per unit uh, resistance. Uh, re inductance, conductance, and capacitance. So there you go. That's how you figure the characteristic impedance. So the impedance of coax really then is calculated from this um, little um, square root, if you will. And it's um, the, the S, by the way, in this little equation simply re represents um, J omega. J is the um, in, uh, square root of negative one, the, um, uh, the imaginary unit, if you will. And the omega is simply two pi F in this case. But that you know, really doesn't matter because what happens is that because the G, which is the conductances um, and the resistance are very, very small, what happens is that, this, that the Z naught, in other words, the, the characteristic impedance of the coax turns out to be simply uh, the square root of L over C, you know, give or take. Now, the reason that coaxial cable that we typically use as amateurs is 50 ohms is because of that very example. So for instance, if you were to take like um, RG8X, and there's many different kinds of um, amateur type coax. Um, I just use this as an example. Um, this one measures about 0 0.077 microhenries per foot. If you were to, to just check it out on an analyzer. And if you look at it up in a chart, you can find out that it's close to about 30.8 picofarads per foot. So using those two measurements, then the characteristic impedance is again, the inductance divided by the capacitance, square root of that, and that turns out to be about 50 ohms. So that's where we get that. Um, people are often, well, sometimes are confused about where 50 ohms comes from. They stick their own meter on a piece of coax and it's infinite and they kind of go, well, where did the 50 ohms come from? Well, now you know. Anyway, that feeds into what we want to talk about. So this is regardless of frequency because you notice from that equation that the frequency got canceled out. So that's why it's frequency -less to a point. So in the ideal world, the impedance of a transmission line matches the one in your transceiver. And the impedance of the load, in other words, your antenna, matches that of the transmission line and the transceiver. Again, 50 ohms, right? Everything is 50 ohms and everybody's very happy. So this allows for what we call maximum power transfer. And so that is that the most power that you can transfer from your transceiver to that antenna occurs when all three of those impedances are equal. So, but in the real world, we don't often see that. So what happens is, yes, the impedance of the transmission line matches that of the source. Your transmission line is 50 ohms. Your, your transceiver is 50 ohms. But that's kind of where it ends because the transmission or the impedance of your antenna does not always match that of the transmission line. And when the signal encounters an antenna impedance that does not perfectly match uh, that of the transmission line, part of that signal is actually reflected back to the transceiver. And that reflection is what we're after here. So this is kind of a diagram of that reflection. Um, so the reflection is measured by what, what's known as a reflection coefficient. Uh, and, and I've um, represented it here by this capital gamma, which is kind of a convention for this reflection coefficient. And this is simply uh, measured by the reflected voltage divided by the forward voltage. And that's, that's it for the reflection. 
However, so the reflection coefficient is something we can use now to calculate SWR. So by the way, the, the values we're talking about here when we, when we talk about voltage, current, and impedance are all complex numbers. But um, as far as our calculations for SWR goes, all we need are two things. One is a magnitude. Here's, here's the complex number in general. And the magnitude um, is um, calculated like this. So basically it's the um, square root of those two values, the, the real portion and the imaginary portion squared. So when you see these double bars around that um, complex number, that just means it's the magnitude. That's what we're after in many cases. But we also have to take the phase angle into account too, just to make sure that we've got our ducks in a row. So we'll get to that. Anyway, um, there's also one more thing to talk about and that's voltage superposition. And what that means is that you simply have two voltages that are on a, you know, a conductor at the same time. And when you have that, they add together or they subtract depending on the voltage values. And that, that comes into play really heavily here. For instance, um, the maximum voltage um, that we see on this line is going to be equal to the forward voltage. In other words, the voltage of that signal going down towards the antenna plus the reflected voltage. And the minimum you are gonna see is that same one voltage that's going to the antenna minus that um, reflected voltage. So this maximum and minimum now are what we use to actually calculate that SWR. So this, then we're going to take our, our VR that we had before from that previous equation and substitute back in that um, reflection coefficient. Because remember, reflection coefficient is the VR divided by the VF. Okay, so we're gonna substitute those in and this is what we get. So based on this voltage max and voltage min, now we can say, this is the definition of a standing wave ratio. It's simply the, the ratio of the mix, maximum and the minimum standing wave voltages. That's all, period. And we could probably just stop right there, but you know what? I guess there's more to talk about with standing wave ratio than this. But there you have it. It's simply that V max divided by V min, which is equal to one plus the, um, the, um, the coefficient of reflection, <laughs> reflection coefficient, sorry, over one minus the same. So there you go, standing wave ratio. Well, that comes from the reflection coefficient, but let's get into that a little bit more. So there is also, by the way, approximation to this SWR we could also make um, because of that, um, that equivalent we just got through doing, because that what it is, is we can also say that the SWR is an approximation by, we can calculate that by the ratio of the impedances at the load. And so here is the basic equation. If we did all the, the algebra, the um, reflection coefficient is also um, this little um, um, quotient as well. So the Z load, the impedance of the load minus the, um, the characteristic impedance divided by those two added together. That's the same um, reflection coefficient we can come up with. Now using that, our SWR, again, our V max over V min, which equals the, the, that quotient that we had before is the same thing then as the maximum of either the resistance equivalent because of our, we're, we're assuming that our, um, our imaginary components of our antenna are gonna be quite small in this case, but it's our, res our resistance divided by our characteristic impedance or characteristic impedance divided by the resistance, whichever is greater. And that's what we call our SWR. So that means that our SWR can be calculated by the impedances measured at the load. And the reason we use it at the load is because we also know that the SWR is going to be same, the same throughout the entire transmission line. So instead of measuring it at a difficult place, we do it at the load where it's much easier. And then we just simply say, now that we got it there, we can measure it throughout. So the implication of that impedance measurement is that therefore you can calculate the SWR if you know your antenna system impedance, or you can calculate your antenna system impedance if you know the SWR. So that's what the, that all means. So for example, if you have a typical half wave dipole and it's up in the air, hopefully high enough, the impedance is about 73 ohms. So this is actually a measure of the radiation resistance, which we're gonna mention just a little bit later, assuming the ohmic resistance is kind of small. So this, what this means is it'll exhibit an SWR of 73 ohms divided by 50, which is a characteristic impedance of your, uh, your, your transmission line again, it's about 1.5 to one. 
So your dipole will automatically, if it's high enough above the ground, exhibit about a 1.5 to 1 SWR. And that's how we get that. So let's take a look at this chart here. Um, it's, I did mention the height of the antenna. And that does play an important factor. So what, that, what this does is tells you that SWR does give you an idea of your antenna's feed point impedance, but it can be drastically affected by antenna height. Now, and this uh, chart is measured in ohms at the left for our um, antenna feed point impedance, but across the bottom, it's the height above the ground and it's in meters. Now, sometimes what I'll have is I'll have somebody come up to me and they'll say, well, you know, Noji, I have put my antenna up 15 feet in the air, about as good as I can get it. And yet my SWR is so high, what, what gives, what can I do? And I'll look at this graph, for instance, and I'll look at this and say, well, let's see, 15 feet, that's about five meters. And I'll look down where it says five meters. And sure enough, it looks like the impedance is clear down near 10 ohms. Let's see, 50 divided by 10, that's a SWR of about five to one. So that makes sense. And it's no wonder their SWR is so high. Their, their antenna is so low to the ground. Now, so please get your antenna up higher if you wanna you know, at least avoid this problem with your SWR. Let me just caveat that by saying to you that, that this graph is very average. It does not apply to all places in the world. Um, unfortunately, our soil in Utah is very poor for conductivity. And so this graph is gonna look a little different than you know, in Utah than it would in this, what you're seeing here. This is probably a graph that's more ideal like in Georgia or Texas or someplace that has great ground. Here, not so much, but so just, just an idea of, of the fact that though that, that the lower your antenna is, the worse your impedance is gonna be and therefore possibly the higher your SWR. So just another idea about SWR there. So question is, so you're, I mentioned that the signal went partly or all the way down to the antenna, but some of it got reflected back. Well, where did that reflected signal go? So the reflected signal actually returned to the transceiver. So because the transceiver output, um, the, the final um, transistors and so forth is largely composed of reactive elements like um, inductance and capacitance, the reflected signal is completely reflected by the transceiver and then is returned again to the antenna. That means the, that your signal goes down to the antenna, part of it comes back to the transceiver, and that part that went back to the transceiver, all of that got re-reflected back to the antenna. So that means that some of your signal will go back to the antenna. Well, the part that went back to the antenna, a portion of that will come back to your transceiver. And you can see that the signal, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. But what happens is the entire process will repeat until the, all the signal is radiated from that antenna with one exception. So that means this signal is just simply going, going to go back and forth, no matter what your SWR is. So regardless of SWR, all your signal will leave your antenna. However, there is something called a transmission line attenuation. And attenuation is simply the reduction of something. In this case, um, signal power. So when a conductor, a conductor passively performs the attenuation, we call it loss. And I'll just say the word loss because we're used to hearing that quite a bit. And all transmission lines have loss because no conductor is perfect. So co coaxial cable though is especially lossy in spite of other um, good advantages about it. I mean, it's inexpensive, it's easy to use. It doesn't couple easily with things around it, but yet we have to live with the loss of that coaxial cable, which means if you want most of your signal to go out of your coaxial cable and to your antenna, you need to get low loss cable per your um, frequency. If you're using two meter cable, I hope you're, you're using LMR 400 or RG213. Um, if you're using your transmission line on 80 meters, then your worry on coax isn't quite so big, but still I would use a go good um, coax anyhow. It's always good to try to reduce your loss no matter what you do. So let's just talk again about this re-reflection that I mentioned there going back to your antenna. First of all, let me just mention something that I, I know that goes against some people's religion. SWR does not represent loss. There are some charts that do show SWR measurements as representing loss. So all the reflected, re-reflected signal is returned to the antenna, except that lost in transmission line. So that means that the 
the signal in your transmission line is the only part that actually gets lost and it gets lost as heat to the surrounding, the, the squirrels, the pot guts, the mice, whatever is near your coax. That's where it goes, but all the rest of it goes right out your antenna. So open wire line, for instance, has almost no loss. If we were to use that instead of coax, you, all your, almost all your signal would be going out to your antenna, no matter what your SWR is. Ladder line, window line, similar, has a very, very low loss. It's just coax. Yeah, and you know what? We all use coax because it's very convenient. Okay, so there is something to be mentioned about return loss. This is a, a, a thing that I have to mention because many people who are, work in um, broadcasting and in industry use this term quite a bit because it's used in some of our calculations. So return loss is used in industry and it's calculated this way. It's simply um, 10 times the log of your incident power divided by your reflected power. So it's kind of reverse upside down of what SWR is. So what this means at, that um, it's a partial misnomer as because number one, it's based on the notion that reflected power is lost power. So it's not really loss at all. And second of all, the lower the SWR, the higher the return loss. So it's kind of, like I said, backwards from that. And we tend to think that, gosh, if it's, SWR is really low, then we have you know, very little loss. But here, the, the return loss is mentioned that way. So it's just a, a, a kind of a semantic that we have to get used to when we talk to people in broadcasting about return loss. But again, I, that's all I'm going to mention about it, because this, but it does have to be mentioned in regard to SWR, because it is part of the discussion. So um, a lot of us, therefore, can measure SWR, and we want to, by using the SWR meter built into your rig. Um, my, I have several HF rigs that have them built into it, or you can have an external meter that displays a number. However, there is a drawback. If you look at this meter that's showing on the screen, it shows an SWR, and it shows that you know how much, how many watts that's being sent out to the antenna. Well, that's really great, but I personally prefer something like a, a, a dual meter, a cross needle um, meter. Um, that shows um, both the forward power and reflected power. And then where those two needles cross, that's where the SWR is. I like this because it shows me a better picture of what really is going on. Um, and one big reason is because I do want to know how much forward power is actually going out of my transceiver. If I don't know that, there is one more thing I'm missing, and I'll get to that. So here we go. This is the crux of what I want to mention, is that too high of an SWR can actually kill you. Did you know that? So and we, we, and that's kind of funny because we always want to get, um, okay, you know what? This is great. I'm, I, I should have gone through this before. I, I sh this, this, this slide was supposed to say too low of an SWR can kill you. So here's my first mistake on my slideshow. It's supposed to say too low of an SWR can kill you. <sighs> All right. So getting around that, my, my face is turning red. But um, what that means is, so if your SWR is below 2.0 and to 1, it'll likely work just fine. If it's even below 3.0, the internal tuners of your most of your HF rigs will take care of that just fine. Um, the point is that I've seen hams that are really well-meaning who really want to get their SWR down really low. And they climb really thin tree branches. They climb up trellises. Uh, they they prop up ladders on top of ladders to reach the really out of reach antennas in their attempts to adjust them and get their SWR that's already 1.3 down to that elusive 1.0 reading. And it's, it's, you know, and I ask why, if it's down to 1.3, you're almost perfect, but no, they got to get it down to 1.0, which in fact, sometimes it's almost impossible. And yeah, sometimes since I like to put up antennas and things, they ask me to do it. And I just say, <laughs> you know, it's not worth it. I don't want to risk my life. So rest assured that there is no need to risk your life to obtain the unobtainable, uh, uh, you know, 1.7 SWR. Here we go. I'll just say that living with an SWR, of say 1.9 across your whole band will work just fine for you. There's no need to get it down and, you know, go through all kinds of extremes to get it out lower. So yes, this slide should, should say, should say um, too low of an SWR can kill you. <laughs> oh. 
All right, so who cares if your SWR is a certain value? So if all the signal except a little goes to the antenna, there are about four reasons, actually, I can think of why people typically want to reduce their antenna system SWR. So granted, there are some good reasons. One, it reduces the feed line loss, which we've already discussed, the amount of um, um, signal that's actually lost through your cable because of the higher SWR. Another is to prevent transceiver foldback. We'll get into that in just a minute. Another is to maintain or improve operating bandwidth. Also something we'll talk about in just a minute, because if you want greater bandwidth, you might want to bring your SWR down. Uh, and the fourth reason is because of bragging rights. My SWR is so low that, well, you know, it, it just makes me look good. So there you go. Let's talk about SWR bandwidth and what that means. It's the bandwidth of your antenna system uh, among the range of frequencies in which will, it, pre it presents to your rig with an SWR of 2.0 or lower. So anywhere that it, that it shows that on your SWR meter, that is your bandwidth. So this gives you a pretty good idea of what your operating range is within your band of interest. So here's a graph that kind of shows that SWR bandwidth. Uh, and for example, the following one shows a sweep of an antenna system, uh, the range for which it's, it's 2.0 or less. Uh, excuse me. And that range is in this graph shows about between 7.0 and 7.21 megahertz. So that means we can say that the antenna system's SWR bandwidth is about 210 kilohertz from 7.0 to 7.21 megahertz. That's what that means. So resonance, the antenna system impedance equals, this is, this is a good equation, you don't have to memorize it, but it's R sub radiation resistance plus R sub ohmic resistance. So radiation resistance plus ohmic resistance plus um, J2 uh, pi FL, which is the um, J times the, um, the inductive uh, reactance minus J divided by the um, 2 pi FC, which one over 2 pi FC is the capacitive reactance. So again, the R sub R is the radiation resistance. O, R, R sub O is the ohmic resistance. Now, all these things are part of your antenna. Now, that's what your impedance comes from. And again, this is our little graph showing our SWR bandwidth. The lowest point in that graph is called the resonant frequency, which is about what, 7.1 megahertz-ish? Okay. And this is the place where the inductive capacitance and the reactances cancel. That means in our little equation up there that the 2 pi FL equals 1 over 2 pi FC. And since those subtract from each other, they subtract, and then all the, all the reactances are gone. And all we're left with then are the two resistances, and that's the ohmic resistance and the radiation resistance. So this is where the re antenna reactances come, up, come into play. So when you're not on the resonant frequency exactly, let's say that you're, this is your bandwidth, which is good, and maybe you're transmitting on, I don't know, 7.15, um, so a little bit above the um, resonant frequency. Just know that what's going on is that all the frequencies to the left of the resonance, um, the antenna is just a bit too capacitive, which is not terrible, but this is the reason that you have not, uh, you're out of the resonance area, which is not bad. Okay, it just means that, that um, your antenna is just too short there. And those to the right of the resonance, it's just a bit too inductive, or in other words, your antenna is just a, bit, a little bit too long there. So, you know, if you want it completely flat, well, that's gonna be next to impossible in many cases. You know, it's kind of fun to think that you're resonant everywhere, but laws of physics being what they are, if you want to move your resonant frequency higher, for example, to that 7.15, you'll just need to shorten your antenna. That's simply the way to get around that. All right, now I also mentioned foldback. So, so once a transceiver detects that, um, that the reflected voltage reaches that specific threshold, it starts reducing its output power to predict, prevent to protect it from being overloaded by using an internal circuit we call a foldback. So in a sense, it monitors SWR to detect when to reduce its power output, but it's trying to predict, protect against overload due to excessively low impedance or high impedance, not the reflected power. That's what the foldback is trying to protect against. So the consequence of foldback is, let's say that you're transmitting, it seems like nobody's hearing you and you check your power output on your meter and your rig, 
And that should display the maximum if you're trying to, for instance, check it on CW or FM or AM. And, and let's say you have your transceiver set to 100 watts, and yet you're looking on your meter, it shows you know, five to 10 watts. And uh, on CW, you, you, you press your key in it and nothing's coming out hardly. And you're going, what the heck is going on? So if your rig's meter doesn't show the maximum, it's very possible that your transceiver could be in foldback due to high SWR. So it's one case when you do want to mitigate that by bringing your SWR down. So either check your SWR with an SWR meter or install a tuner. And a so, tuner can do that trick for you by bringing your SWR down to a reasonable level. There's a, something to remember that, oh, I, maybe you're gonna cover it here. Yes, uh, please go ahead. Oh, I, I think you're about to cover it. Oh. Don't rely on the fold back to protect your radio. I hear, I cringe and I hear people say, Oh, the SWR is high. I can just run the, it, the fold back will protect me. No, no, it doesn't. Um, the road, the road along uh, the Ham Highway is littered with people who thought that <laughs> radios yes. have blown finals. Absolutely, that very true. Yeah, you can't depend on your SWR. I mean, the radio has to see a terrible SWR before it throws it back down. Um, and and so if your SWR is terrible, it tries to put out close to 100 watts for an instant. And in that instant, it'll see high voltage and high current. Now, there's the finals can only handle that so much before they get popped. So absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, and I no, guess that's and I good. guess you I guess you have a broken antenna in that picture. Just <laughs> <laughs> is that intentional? <laughs> right. Okay. Well, you know, it's 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 a picture that I got from somebody and I, you know, I didn't really examine it too well. And it is a broken antenna it appears. So no, okay. it's not intentional. It's just, okay. it's just a background that I just um, threw up there. So it's appropriate though. Okay. <laughs> it is. So the question is then will a high SWR damage your finals? Okay. Well, it can, but the damage is not caused by the reflected power coming back to the transceiver. And that's one myth I'd like to dispel. Uh, oftentimes people will think that, that oh gosh, if SWR, that means I've got reflected, you know, power going in and power coming back, that reflected power must be the thing that's blowing it up. And it's not. So the, in, in the low impedance case of the high SWR, because remember SWR again, can be calculated by, by, um, by a, in, uh, your resistance over your characteristic impedance or your characteristic characteristic impedance divided by your resistance, um, depending on which one's higher. So in the low impedance case of the highest WR, the extra low impedance will cause the power transistor to draw excessive current, overheating that little guy and allowing the, little, the green smoke to escape. So if it's too low of impedance, it, it can just short this thing right out and there goes your final transistor. Now in the high impedance case, in the case of a, a solid state transceiver, for instance, um, the voltage of the pull-up inductor, and a lot of times you'll have a, a pull-up inductor like this in, in the diagram um, because that reduces the losses that you'll have in your power um, amplifier. Um, there's nowhere for the current to flow when, um, when the um, output is um, uh, completely open. And um, so what it happens is that um, the voltage will just continue rising. And that, that there's a voltage that's really critical in these MOSFETs, and it's a, the drain to source. Um, and then when that one gets to a very high amount, which in many cases can be, you know, much higher than that a reflected voltage can be, then it goes to what's known as avalanche breakdown. And that internal BJT will then latch. And then that's the end of your, you know, your, your days on that, um, on that MOSFET. So your power amplifier won't work anymore. So there you go. You can, you can blow it up by low impedance or high impedance. And there's many other ways you can actually blow up your final, but again, Typically, your um, your reflective power does not blow up your final. <laughs> Still, had to mention it. And uh, yeah, thanks for that addition, Clint. Appreciate that. So, how can we get you SDR, get our SWR down if we need to to satisfy those four re, you know um, desires? One of which was bragging rights. Okay, to get your SWR down, well, get your antenna up higher, like we mentioned about the height diagram. Now reconstruct or redesign your antenna. Uh, use a tuner. Tuner helps quite a bit. Now, or you can use a different kind of matching device, which I'll show you in just a minute. 
use dummy dummy load. I mean, here's a picture of a dummy load. And just keep in mind that a dummy load has an SWR of perfect 1.0 to one. Of course, not many people are gonna hear you, but you know, <laughs> some antennas will act like a dummy load and they'll give you a 1.0 to one SWR, but you know, it's kind of hard to hear. Or you can just risk your life anyway and get up in that, um, up in their, up in your um, thinly placed um, branches and fix your antenna. Well, okay, if you do use a tuner, just understand that I, for me, this is my opinion that a tuner is aptly named because it tunes your antenna system for optimal operation. Um, now, there are some hams that believe that a tuner just makes your radio happy. But that's kind of like saying that a, that a power supply only makes your radio happy because, you know, your rig enjoys being fed with 12 volts, but it gets really angry when it, you attempt to feed it with 120 volts AC. Okay, well... Honestly, for most rigs I've encountered are quite emotionless. Just understand that, that a tuner doesn't simply make your radio happy. It actually tunes your system. So that's why it's not a misnomer. A tuner really does do this and it, um, it will make it so that it'll bring, your, it'll bring your system in a matching position. And its purpose is to provide a conjugate match. And, and, and again, I didn't go into any details about this because Again, what's coming back from your antenna is seen as, a, um, as an impedance that's a complex number. And that complex number will then have a, you know, a real component and an imaginary component. And a tuner simply um, you know, uh, matches the real component, but will reverse the um, imaginary component and therefore cancel that out. And that's what that does. It, it simply provides a conjugate match for your antenna system. So here's a different kind of matching device. Um, you can use any one of these different things, which it could be a pi match, a pi L match, T match, gamma match. Uh, there are many different kinds of matching, passive matching devices you can use. There are, are active um, devices you can use as well. But anyway, this I just wanted to throw these in because there are ways you can actually bring down your SWR by using these matching devices or a tuner. So now, there we go. I just want to mention just a couple last things. And number one, it, this is kind of a conclusion here. If your highest SWR across the band is 1.9 to one, please just leave your antenna alone. If your entire bandwidth is under 1.9, you're good to go. Uh, uh, just understand too though, that a low SWR says nothing about performance or efficiency. So a low SWR does not guarantee that you have a good antenna or even a good signal or that you're getting out at all. It's just like that dummy load, um, example, has a great SWR, but not many people are going to hear you. For HF, I recommend using a rig that does contain an internal tuner or even purchasing an external tuner. Um, and the reason, because if, if you have an antenna that you have just perfectly honed down, it's just giving you wonderful SWR readings across the band, there are times when you might accidentally, you know, do something wrong. You might accidentally um, not connect your antenna. You might um, a bird might be sitting on your antenna and break something. I don't know, things can go wrong. And we've seen this at field day and on my house and other places. I always recommend you connect a, a tuner. And that way you're protected to some degree. Um, you're protecting your rig. And that's what you're trying to do. If you're new to HF, I recommend getting an automatic tuner instead of a manual one. Manual tuners are wonderful and you can work them um, just wonderfully. I mean, if you know how to work a manual tuner, you're, you can uh, do the very best. But oftentimes for a new person who is new to HF, uh, that can be a little frustrating um, exercise. And so uh, I, I often recommend getting an automatic tuner for a new person. And anyway, there you have it. Um, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm, I assume that you would have asked them during the presentation, but hey, in case you were chicken or didn't want to say anything, this is your time. Um, all ears, although that probably kind of looks funny, huh? <laughs> and this is KN0JI. <laughs> well, yeah. If you're a Ferengi, that would make sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I've told people for years that under two to one, it's don't mess with it if it's under if it's if it's two to one or under. Um, when I take people up to like six two, they're kind of shocked, like they transmit antenna is 1.8 to 1 and the receive antenna is like 2.5 to 1. 
Um, and for receive antenna, SWR is kind of irrelevant. Um, people that run microwave or in moon bounce will tell you that their preamps work best if they're are the quietest and work best when their SWR is not low. I mean, that's one weird thing about those. And the output of your radio dirty little secret is almost never 50 ohms. It's a nominal 50 ohms is sort of a suggestion. They'll produce the rated power at 50 ohms and they're adjusted thusly, but they're not 50 ohm, they're not 50 ohm output amplifiers on the radios, not at all. They're kind of 50 ish. Usually they're actually a bit on the low side, I've noticed. Um, Paul Plack asks, um, a tuner of the radio makes the radio quote happy, as it were, but you know, you didn't use the word happy. But what about coax loss? Um, I guess you're going to tell me there's no free lunch, which we all knew. But <laughs> but um, what do you say to people who may be unaware of that, or when they use a tuner, or just using it as a band aid, and should might be unaware that they have another problem? That's one of the issues that I have. Uh, you know, concerns I have when somebody uses a built-in tuner on a radio. You better have a SWR bridge on the line because one of the most important things to do when you put up an antenna is find out where the SWR is and you put it up. And then a year later, if they aren't the same, something's wrong. So absolutely. So your advice is what on that? Uh, you know, it's like isn't it just a band aid? You know, don't I don't I just have the same or more loss? If I run a tuner, and and for okay, number one, first of all, um, tuners exhibit very little or no loss. It's just lost in the resistive components inside the tuner, uh, and because they're um, pretty much a, um, a reactive components that they present to the antenna side, um, pretty much everything that that comes back from the antenna uh, is reflected back to the antenna, and because there's. Um, there's no loss there. There's, it doesn't really heat up. But per se. I, I would beg to diff you, differ with you on that. Okay. For roughly three or four to one, that is true. But uh, if you have, if you have higher losses than that, so, like a classic example was, I was at field day running an MFJ uh, 300 watt tuner into a, into a ladder line, which is nowhere near 50 ohms because the antenna was not resonant. It was not designed to be resonant. I was not having any luck at all until I switched from the 300 watt MFJ tuner to a to the uh, two kilowatt Heathkit tuner, mainly because the 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 inductor that was glowing red hot was where the heat was going in the low power tuner because it was not well suited for this. You can get a match. But if your SWR is higher than three to one, you should really watch out. About I could see losses. that, yeah, because if the components aren't rated for the power that you're expecting, it, it could really burn up. That's true, right? And, so, and and also, yeah, you can have a lot of loss if you've got if you got a high SWR and the internal, um, even the resistive components, well, the the wires even, uh, you know, can get can get too warm. So yeah, you're right on that. The the, the, the worst on. the worst case. I, in general, there's a German guy who actually has lined up, I don't know where I got him, two or three dozen tuners and measured the input and output losses of different impedances. Everybody's fine below three to one, doesn't matter who it is. But one of the things that were the tuner, almost all tuners fall apart is if the impedance that you're feeding, trying to match with the tuner is much lower than 50 ohms. A classic example is is supposing you have a, a doublet or something like that with a four to one ballon on it. If your antenna impedance is like 33 ohms and you have a four to one ballon, 33 divided by four is like eight and a third ohms, something like that. Right. Antenna tuners are miserably awful and you'll probably burn a, you'll burn a coil up if you tried that. I mean, I, I've yes, seen- Yes, the impedance is so low that, that yes, shows it right out. Yeah. So, do you really need a ballon? And a lot of tuners are much better off if you're trying to tune something really high, you know, or higher than, you know, two or 300, even a thousand ohms. But if you start going down into the tens of ohms, you know, uh, you know, better hold the phone Units. and, yeah. and uh, turn, you know, turn on the fans because you're going to burn <laughs> something up. Very good. Let's see here. 
Um, let's see. Davis Austin does mention the tuners that use fried cores have appreciable losses, and um, that is definitely the case. Uh, ferrite is great. It's for good for matching, but uh, if you're going to use a ferrite as the to load the coil in in a tuner, there uh, it's it's not great. Or ferrite, or I could I guess not ferrite as much as iron powder. Yeah, the iron powder is very lossy. Well, it's it's lower loss than more. ferrite, but still, yes. Yeah. If ideally you want air everything because air isn't very lossy. The wire might be, but air isn't. Yes. Um. Let's see, David Sauce also suggested if at all possible, put the antenna, I'm paraphrasing what he says, put the in, remote antenna tuner remote as close to the antenna as you possibly can. That sort of circumvents the uh, comment that uh, Paul Plack had that if you're going to use the tuner, isn't the loss going to be the problem in your feed line? Well, if you put the antenna. Yeah, I, I, antenna. I actually don't believe in that. Um philosophy because if I, and I, I, I think that comes from uh, Maxwell's um, Reflections chapter 17, in which he talks about placement of the tuner, that if you, it, that some people really do advocate putting it right at the antenna to reduce coax loss, but um, he says that it, because the, no matter where the tuner is, if it's matching, it, it actually matches the entire system. So the whole system is, is gonna have, be um, pretty much lossless regardless of where that tuner is placed. That's what his feeling is. Well, I mean, that, that, can, be, that can be demonstrated, uh, as you mentioned earlier, that, that can be demonstrated to the contrary when you run coax that has potentially high loss well away from its characteristic impedance, you lose it as heat. Yes, yes, I can see that if it's really high right. loss coax. The other, the other issue that people, uh, that, you know the other th the other concern, of course, is is that I've liked how you've used the word antenna system, not antenna, yes, not feed line, the antenna that. system, because the in the impedance you get at the end of the coax is n almost never going to be the same impedance you get at the antenna. If it's a quarter wave off, it inverts it. I mean, you're just rotating around a Smith chart all the time. Right. Yeah. Just if every every half way that it repeats itself and so forth. So yep, you're right. Right, right. And and the and the reason I, I personally use window line, I've used window line almost my entire ham career with a manual tuner. 450 or 300 or something? Um, it doesn't really matter. It's just low loss. So I can yes. have a 25 or 50 or 101 SWR. And it, in that case, since the line is more or less transparent from a power loss perspective, it doesn't matter where I place the tuner. But it, Gordon and I used to joke all the time was, you know, somebody would be complaining about the SWR, we'd say, well, just tell them to run 100 feet of RG-174 and it'll be great. Oh, gee. And, and in the case, taking that's an extreme, but in that particular case, you would have to agree that your admonition that the placement of the tuner did not matter absolutely does matter in that case. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So Huge there's loss. a little yeah. asterisk you got to put on some of that. But uh, anyway, um, let's see. Let's see, uh, Greg Long asked the question, and I'm not quite sure I understand it. What's the difference between, what's the difference, let me try this again. What is the difference at the receiving end between a 1.9 and a 1.0 SWR? So what's um, a, what's a receiving end? Um, I'm not sure. Um, okay. Generally speaking, SWR has much less of an effect on receive because you know everybody nowadays, if they do, if they work on antennas, if you don't have a nano VNA, you should get one <laughs> because I mean for fifty to hundred bucks for hex sake, it'll answer this question. If you if if you do this simple exercise, if you hook the nano VNA uh, up, you know through a a pad and calibrate it properly, you'll notice that the SWR of your receiver is not all that great. I mean, it's like two to one, two and a half, could be lower, but whatever, depending on have you have a pad in it, and it really doesn't have much of an effect on receive, for the most part. I, I think the only time that I've really seen, and you, you talk about, you said broadcasters talk about return loss. The main, the main problem you get with return loss 
in non-amateur applications is in wide bandwidth like digital or video transmissions where if you get uh, SWR change across the bandwidth of the signal you are trying to transmit or you get reflection, you can cause intersymbol interference, which is beyond what we want to go to, but essentially where the power comes back and interferes with your own signal because it's delayed, because it's wide bandwidth. Now, hams running HF will never run across that, never. Um, but uh, if you're if you're if you're on like you know five gigahertz and have a you know forty meg wide signal you're trying to be digital play digital with, if you have a high return loss it can break your mm -hmm. it can break it ruin your constellation ruin your ISI all sorts of other thing, whatever the name you want to attach to it. Yeah, I have a um, a short wave receiver. It was it's a it's a Texan um, PL six sixty mm -hmm. and. And for that thing, um, I just take a spool of wire and I just throw it over my bushes and my trees. Mm. And I don't even care what the SWR is. It's probably humongous, but boy, I can bring in the whole world with that little receiver. So yeah, you're right. The SWR plays very little role in that. Yeah, in fact, a little uh, E-field whips, you know, they're just a capacitor. Their SWR is for all practical purposes, infinity. Yeah. But all they're literally sniffing, you're sniffing capacitance, their capacitance, Stick, stuck into the ether and amplifying it so the um so to a lesser degree the receive impedance and matching is less important if you if you get a really really long cable then perhaps one, one thing you do get if you have a really terrible terrible swr you can actually get the peaks and signal you know this if you swept across a large bandwidth you see sometimes the signals reinforce and sometimes they don't depending yes. on your speed length or matching and that can, in an extreme case like if you have to be many units of swr but in your case as long as you can as long as you hear more noise with your antenna connected <laughs> than you do without it connected you're hearing all the signal there is <laughs> yeah good point that's a great point um uh, dave sauce does make the comment that um a long length of coax can improve the swr because the loss can cause the impedance <laughs> at the end to approach the characteristic impedance. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like uh, adding a linear, long dummy load, you know, 100 foot long dummy load. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess uh, so. It's, it's right. not me, but yeah, why not? <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't recommend that. Um, but what, one of the things, though, that I discovered a long time ago, and this is particularly true with automatic tuners, sometimes you'll get a you, you'll come across the tuner antenna tuner combination that doesn't match case in point i was uh somebody's house they're trying to use their tri-bander on 17 meters now we all know it's not going to be much of an antenna but if that's the only antenna you have available uh, then you might as well try but his antenna absolutely refused to tune on 17 meters mm. you know we don't know if it was trying to do the 15 or 20, 20 meter traps so i just i rummaged around found a piece of coax maybe about eight or 10 feet long and stuck it in there and it tuned. Now, it did not actually improve the match. It was still the same SWR, but on the Smith chart, it rotated somewhere else where the tuner and the radio could actually deal with it. You know, made it more inductive, made it more capacitive. Who knows what it did? But it did make the tuner, quote, happy. I know you don't like that word, <laughs> but, but at least the tuner said, oh, I can deal with this. I mean, that's not out of the scope. so. That's a little trick. And he was able to make the contacts. So it sounds, sounds like kind of a stub match, but yeah, that's, that's cool. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not really a stub match. It's just that making the, making the, uh, giving the tuner something it could work with. Yes. Uh, Alan Volpe. around the Smith chart. I yeah. have a question. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Morris. Well, my question uh, involves coax versus ladder line. Okay. Um, it seems to me, well, what I uh, tell my students is that ladder line is a more difficult media to use because the routing of the ladder line is much more critical than it is with coax. Uh, <clears throat> one of my friends routed his ladder line down through his metal um, rain gutters and then down through the downspout and into his house and wondered why it didn't work yeah <laughs> and 
So yeah. we just we replaced his ladder line with coax and it worked just fine. But that's anytime you run across something where the energy can be coupled from the ladder line to whatever it is, especially metal materials or even trees with sap in them, uh, you lose energy. So yeah, depending on the frequency, I tell people that if they use on ladder line window line, they need to keep it, you know, anywhere from six to 10 feet away from anything conductive, like dirt, your trees, your cat swing set, your gutters, soffit. So yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, um, that's, that's probably a bit overkill, but I think the, what is it, the general, the general consensus, if you keep it more than 10 times the wire spacing apart from metal, you probably won't notice it unless you look for it. So uh, I have, I have 400 ohm nominally 400, well, it's supposed to be 450, but it's really 400 ohm window line. That's maybe about an inch across and and, and if it's more than a foot, foot and a half away, I, I've, I've checked it and it doesn't seem to affect anything until you get it within closer to a foot. And it, it just, it like it passes near-ish a metal shed. And, you know, I mean, and it also kind of, it used to kind of go within a couple of feet of my gutter, but it never made a difference. But as in an extreme example, like Morris said, if you run it through a uh, ferrous and lossy material, then it's no longer a ladder line or window line or whatever you call it. It's it's just pieces of wire in in a terrible in a, in a terrible shield. Yes. Um, the other criticism that I've heard is that if you bring ladder line into your shack, you're introducing RF that uh, could be dangerous for you know. Um, okay. Yeah. Only, only if it's not balanced. Uh, I can speak to that. So here, here's here's something that might be staggering to people. If you own a four to one ballon that does not have two ferrite separate ferrite cores in it, it is not balanced. It does not that BAL part is 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 not true, the balanced part. Yeah, there, you've created an auto transformer instead of a true you're absolutely correct. Right. If you if you own a four to one ballon or you use a tuner with a four to one ballon, and I can tell you right now no one no one in no one at all makes a properly balanced four to one balance that's incorporated into any tuner nobody does the only commercial proper balance that i know you can find that has two cores is there's one or two models of that balance designs make are truly balanced four to one balance but zero people mfj um Elecraft, nobody makes a I don't even think Elecraft has a four to one ballon. Their tuners, do they? I don't know. I don't know either. But, but yeah, but, Bellon Designs makes a lot of really good ones. Like they have the the forty two hundred five and the huh? forty one hundred series. Those ones are are fabulous because there's they're totally isolation transformers. Right, right. If 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 you get a four to one ballon and you do not have two cores in your four to one ballon, what that means is is what Noji says it's an auto transformer. What that also means is that it's it's not really balanced and here, here's a here's a good test uh i have window line in my house uh, coming into my shack i have a three through through my window with ceramic stands off standoffs if i disconnect one wire or the other wire of the balanced line it goes down like three or four ice units uh, signals go down like 20 or more db if i i bet you, if if you can if you connect if you disconnect just one leg of your wind balanced line from your ballon, and things do not go down three, four S units. It is not what you think it is. It's not balanced. And in that particular case, you are bringing RF into the shack. I, I originally, when I first put this station up, um, I, I did not have a properly balanced ballon, and I kind of ignored it for a while. But But I also noticed that I was getting buzz from switching supplies and stuff like that. And and so finally it's like, okay, I'm gonna take care of this. And I and I actually properly isolated the line. I, I bought it from Ballon Designs because I was in a hurry. And that pretty much made the shack noise go away. The, the, all the computers and monitors in the shack, they disappeared from that. And also 
I really didn't have much of an RF, but the, the, the bellwether device in a shack, if you're getting RF into it, is computer speakers. If your computer speakers talk to you while you're talking on the radio, you <laughs> probably don't have things as balanced as you, well as you'd like. So you probably need to put a choke ballon on. Now that doesn't have a lot to do with SWR, but still uh, it's worth mentioning. It's a fun topic. Oh yes, it's, and I imagine it's a loaded topic because I imagine wars have been fought for less. <laughs> here. Um, let's see, what other comment here? Um, oh, okay. And you were talking about a resident antenna. I guess a resident is in the eye of the beholder. A classic example of a non-resident antenna in the classical sense is the NFED half wave. It is, if you define a resonance as something, well, I, I guess the resonance would be where the J goes to zero. Yeah, at the particular frequency of interest. Right, and and for convenience sake, J goes to zero, the capacitance and inductive reactants go to zero at a convenient impedance where your radios work. An NFED halfway is about as far from that as you can possibly imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, let's see, do we have any more? Uh, uh... Yeah, that being said, I, I have used NFED half waves uh, oh. several times, but you gotta, you gotta kind of know what you're doing and use a really good um, balanced 49, 49 to one, at least in my experience, um, um, unin, and that works really well. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, and, and contrary to belief, they do need a counterpoise of some kind. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. Wow. I, I don't know many people who will admit that, but well, that's true. You do have to counterpoise that. There, 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 actually, Mike Blodajowski a couple months ago uh, at this venue did do a presentation on and fed half wave. And if you haven't caught that, I would, it's, it's, it's worth because uh, he and the Ballon Designs guy have go, gone back and forth. He has the luxury of real estate and, and uh, and and uh, he's a demon with antenna modeling. When he put the antenna up at, when he designed the antenna for the Leamington station, the 160 meter NFED half wave, it was freaky how close the predicted plot went to hmm. match the actual antenna one. And we we only had to short it, shorten the wire a couple of feet because he left the wire long because it's easier to shorten them than lengthen them. Yes, so anyway. Very good. Uh, yeah. So, any other comments? Uh, I think looking here, the uh, at the uh, um, oh, uh, Gabe Campbell uh, mentioned that he's a fairly new ham. He said he got a nice letter from you, Noji, uh, after yeah, he got yeah. licensed a few months ago, and he just wanted to say thanks. Kilo oh, Echo Six welcome. Bravo Alpha Lima. Oh, I'm making a blush. Well, hey, um, and um, welcome to the world of amateur radio. Yeah, I mean. The, the thing I like to tell people, and I hope you tell them too, is you learn more from screwing up and failing and then figuring out what you did. <laughs> and often that involves asking people what I did wrong than, than if you're successful. If everything you put together is works the first time. If that's true, that means that I've learned the most. <laughs> yes, I, I, I can tell that. So much. Yes, yes. And the the key is, is it's okay to screw up, but it's also to figure out wh why you screw screw yeah. it up. Oh, okay. I, somebody told me I hadn't turned my camera back on. I'll have to fix that in post. Anyway, anyway, thank you, Morris. Um, all right. Any uh, other comments? I think that about wraps it up. Then, thank you, Noji. Uh, thank been, you. Appreciate uh, it. Uh, greatly appreciate your presentation. And uh, come along some other time when we figure out what else to uh, pick your brain about. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and, thank you uh, very much, Clint, for that time. Well, okay. I hope you enjoyed the presentation as well as the corner. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Noji. Anything else we have a question for? Um, oh, um, okay. Um, Bruce Bergen comes. I need to ask this too. Um, Bruce Bergen needs help with his tower. Uh, he has, I think his uh, beam has slid down on the mast and is jamming the uh, thrust bearing. So it needs to probably need to figure out how to do a work party to climb his tower and break that loose and take care of that. Um, uh, Laird uh, 
WB7TGP says, thanks, you know, G, for an excellent uh, presentation. And uh, Paul Plack says, thank you for doing what you do in Utah County and other places. Um, so <laughs> I, I used to kid Gordon about this, and I will say the same to you. Don't get hit by a bus. <laughs> I'll try not to. Um, but you know, can I just say one last thing about Gordon, though? Sure. Let me just say that he was a good friend. Right. And he's a great man. And he and I have talked so many times. And, and, and we, yes, we have disagreed too. But well, I'll tell you, I have the highest respect for him. And, and what I did um, a few months ago is I went to his place. Well, I've been to his place several times, but once to interview him. And so um, the result of that interview will be put together into a, um, a silent key um, article that I'll publish here in about a couple of weeks in, in the UVARC newsletter. So, okay. and I could send you, you know, a copy of just that section alone. Sure. If you'd like. Yeah, the uh, next month's microvolt will be Gordon heavy. Awesome, awesome. I mean, and also the uh, June meeting will, I mean, um, just a few weeks, we decided as you apparently did, we could either throw a half hat, hat slap dash, throw something together in short order, or think about it and reflect on it and do do a proper send off, as it were. And oh, that's that's chosen, very good. Yeah. We've chosen the latter, more yeah. or less. Okay. Very good. Appreciate it, Noji. Thank, Thank you. you. And with that, uh, unless somebody has something else, I will end this meeting. Thank you for coming. Uh, we are going to try to get to get this live meeting in-person meetings going again in September. We're still working that out. They'll be up at the U again, as far as we know. Um, and we will do our best to make sure they are streamed live because people have gotten used to sitting in their easy chair at home on the big screen, seeing people bigger than they look in person. So we will do what we can for that. At the very least, they will be recorded and posted as we do now in an edited format. format. So with that, Everyone drive safely if you're driving anywhere, which is always a good thing to say. And also be safe in general and have fun on the air. 7-3. Seven, 7-3. Three. Seven, three. Thank you, Noji.